East Timor is once again turning on itself. The past few weeks have seen the worst violence since the militia rampages of 1999. But this time it's not led by Indonesia, it's East Timor's own soldiers fighting each other. A conflict that began as a dispute over army promotions has unleashed a simmering discontent with the Fretland-led government. Few have trusted their leaders to resolve the conflict or believed the bland assurances that everything was under control. I am sure that the police did not fire any single shot into a defenseless, defenseless crowd. Instead, tens of thousands have fled their homes, ready to believe the worst. Four years after independence, this is a nation on a knife edge, haunted by its past, overwhelmed by its present, and fearful of its future. We are here because we don't have any safety, we don't have any security, because we don't have any security in the house. We don't have any security. The violence that began on April 28th has catapulted East Timor back into the spotlight. But there's a far wider resentment against the government than even these protests suggest. And it's not over this violence, but over what they suffered at the hands of Indonesia. While the government struggles to deal with the present, it's told its people to forget about getting justice for the past. There is not going to be an international tribunal of any sort. We, Timorese, also genuinely do not believe that it will serve the purpose of justice and democracy in this country. Our leaders uh, try to, to betray our people. And people feel that they are betrayed with, uh, by our government. Away from the capital, Dili, life appears calm. But in towns like Maliana, near the Indonesian border, there is little peace in people's minds. This is one of the country's most scarred and traumatized communities. In 1999, during a UN-sponsored referendum on East Timor's future, it bore the brunt of militia violence. The Indonesian army used hired gangs of East Timorese collaborators to intimidate and punish supporters of independence. Every day these women come to work in the building where their families were slaughtered. Grisilda Santos Marquez and her friends are recruits in East Timor's new police force. But in September 1999, when Indonesia controlled the police station, they had to watch as their families were killed in front of them.
Today, a small monument commemorates this massacre of nearly 50 innocent civilians. It was one of countless atrocities during the quarter century campaign for independence. Like Priscilla, all the survivors want the killers and the people who commanded them to be brought to justice. But despite winning independence, the people are still waiting for justice. To their anger and frustration, their own government is fighting to stop any war crimes trials. There are many friends among us tonight. Jose Ramos Horta was the public face of Fretland's independent struggle during 24 years in exile. To help our dreams for independence become a reality. Now, as foreign minister, he's telling his people there's nothing to be gained by pursuing their tormentors. The priority is to build the institutions of this country, the administration trying to build the semblance of an economy, all of that. The fruits of independence are that uh, uh, we are free today, this is the greater act of justice. The gruesome evidence uncovered since independence leaves no doubt that Indonesia directed the militias and that Indonesian commanders took part in torture and murder. Maybe you shot and tortured. Witness testimonies and forensic investigation, much of it by Australian experts, have produced detailed indictments for crimes against humanity. Green bending. Former Fretel and Guerrilla Longuinos Monteiro is now Chief Prosecutor for East Timor's UN-sponsored Serious Crimes Unit. He's in charge of hunting down more than 300 indicted killers. Uh, I might say 93% of the suspects is at, at large. Presumably in Indonesia. Yes, yes yep. it is. Does Indonesia give any cooperation whatsoever? Well, uh, so far, no. Indonesia has not only refused to hand over its alleged killers, its own trials held under international pressure have been a farce. Only one man has been convicted, the East Timorese militia leader, Eureka Guterres. Not a single Indonesian will be punished. To your knowledge, are any of the indicted war criminals still serving with the Indonesian authorities? Most of them, yes. yes. Some getting retired, but most of them are still there. And some promoted? Some, yes, of course. Viva Timor Rosa! But even East Timor's president, the former resistance leader, Janana Gujmao, says East Timor has more important things to do than demand Indonesia hand them over for trial. Este é aqui o ponto mais importante agora, quando começamos um, a governar, quando começamos a ser um Estado, um, termos governo, temos tudo quanto uh, deve olhar mais para beneficiar este povo que sofreu para sermos hoje um Estado. What's more, the government is considering pardoning the war criminals its own courts convicted. Thanks largely to Australian peacekeepers, authorities were able to imprison 88 militiamen who hadn't managed to flee across the border with their Indonesian commanders. But the government says it may soon set them free. 
even those serving 28-year terms for crimes against humanity. If we are not able to bring to trial the more serious complex one in Indonesia, then is it right for us to keep holding on to the small fish? Don't you want them to rot in jail to pay for no, their crimes? No, no. Definitely not for uh, one reason. Many of them, most of them, are small fish. The unrest of recent weeks has only strengthened the government's belief that it has bigger fish to fry. The way these latest protests spiralled out of control says much about the fragility and disunity of East Timor's new democracy. Nearly 600 soldiers from the western provinces complained they were being passed over by soldiers from the east the main centre of resistance to the Indonesian occupation. Rather than addressing their complaints, the Defence Ministry sacked more than a third of its new army. When they rioted, the government called out the rest of the army to fight their former comrades. But the protest leader, Gustav Salsina, has made clear they'll keep fighting. Despite repeated assurances that the situation has normalised, the conflict has continued to simmer with growing fears of civil war. The last thing the government wants to risk now is trouble with Indonesia. Here also we have to juggle sensitivities. Whenever we deal with a problem, we have to weigh you know, every sensitivity. And uh, sometimes we do not do certain things that we should have been doing, so that we don't uh, you know, upset one group or uh, another. Indonesians, you multiply that by 100 times. <laughs> But that stance has outraged the Catholic Church, still the most powerful institution outside the government. More than 95% of East Timorese belong to the church, which has blended Western ceremony with deep-seated animist ritual. service in the town of Likasar attracted 6,000 worshippers. Coincidentally, it was at the site of one of the worst of the Indonesian-led massacres. In April 1999, Indonesian police herded thousands into the church telling them they'd be safe. Then they sent in the militias to kill people at random. to 60 people died. The Bishop of Dili, Ricardo da Silva, has appealed to UN Secretary General Kofi Annan for an international court to force Indonesians to trial. That must be done, certainly. How can people live in, uh, nowadays in the Buddhist world if, it, if the small people continue to be oppressed, for example? It's impossible. But East Timor is opposing all calls for UN trials, claiming it would undermine Indonesian efforts to reform its military. If we claim that we are friends of Indonesia, of the new Indonesia, uh, should we then turn around and uh, call for an international tribunal? Well, how stupid would that be? But the church argues there will never be stability if the past is ignored. Father Martinho Guzmão, no relation to the president, is the church spokesman on peace and justice. 
the government talked about amnesty, about the forgiveness of pardon, but they, they don't want to touch justice. That's quite uh, unlogical. We have to show even the high class or the low class of people here, we are the same under law, under justice. That's the process. By some estimates, up to a sixth of East Timor's population died during the Indonesian occupation. Every person lost loved ones, relatives and friends. The UN Security Council demanded trials for the 1999 militia violence, but only because for once there were UN observers and international media to record it. For most of the occupation, Indonesia made sure the outside world never witnessed its crimes. This house in Balibo is where five Australian-based journalists were executed by Indonesian soldiers in 1975 as they covered the invasion. Their murders marked the start of a brutal occupation that killed more than 100,000 people, even before the militia killings of 1999. It seems almost incredible that not a single victim of these documented war crimes has ever had justice. And some of their murderers still live openly across the border, just down the road. The main army units that once occupied East Timor are now based in West Timor, along with the remnants of the Indonesian-backed militias. Until recently, the border was guarded by Australian peacekeepers. Now, with the UN withdrawing all but a skeleton staff of advisers, it's likely defended by a small group of East Timorese border police. Relations are cordial for the moment, but the government claims Indonesia could easily send militias back on another rampage. Yeah. Our borders would not be peaceful. If our borders are peaceful, it's because the Indonesian military leadership follow the orders of the leadership in Jakarta, not to attempt, not even to think to destabilize East Timor. They could very well do it. If they decide to do it, what would the Security Council do to help us? What would the international community do to help us? Yet in Maliana, the border town most vulnerable to incursions, many people are prepared to risk Indonesia's wrath. Jose Andrade is the Fretland MP for Maliana. He's faced a frosty reception over the government's policy of clemency for war crimes. Promete Sasa Miami, Tamba Mine Direito at Ukuna. Neba mi Husu was senhor, para bele condena oficial Indonesio, general Indonesio, by a tribunal internacional, e a mi Husu must then hari tribunal internacional, e a nação Timor Leste Nela. Jose Andrade is himself a victim of the violence. In 1999, he was beaten and tortured at this Indonesian army base on the direct orders of the area commander, Buranadin Siagian. The beating left him almost dead and blind in one eye. The commander Siagian and his deputy Sutrisno have both been indicted for crimes against humanity. Their descriptions appear on Interpol's wanted site. But both continue to serve in the Indonesian army and both have been promoted. Andrade admits to mixed feelings about his own party's policy. 
uh, o, o indivíduo, mas esse estudo são, podemos ver, mas aquele que uma, fizeram assassinos e mataram muitos que perderam a vida e isso por causa disso que é, tem de ser passar pela caso crime e depois vão ser julgados para tribunal. Isto é que... The government counters that even calling for trials could mean an economic blockade. East Timor relies on Indonesia for 80% of its imports and all its oil. Where would we buy the 10 times more expensive goods from Australia? It's great to be uh, brave on what is politically correct, on what might be demagogically correct as well. But uh, I, as foreign minister, my president as president, the prime minister as prime minister, we have uh, to uh, be a bit more realistic and less heroic. But some believe the government's pragmatism verges on indecency. One of the most wanted war criminals is the Indonesian army commander Camilo de Santos, indicted for crimes against humanity, including the murder of a Dutch journalist during the Indonesian withdrawal. On a visit to West Timor in 2001, President Gujmal not only met him, he publicly embraced him. He says it's all part of moving on from the past. Se nós vamos a olhar para cada com o um espírito de vingança no coração e na mente, vamos ficar com este peso. Some believe the former resistance has a shared interest with Indonesia in stopping war crimes trials. Public hearings in East Timor also heard testimony of atrocities by fretland guerrillas, including execution of political opponents. Maybe uh, Fratellini also afraid that they are they also committed in various crimes against uh, pro-Indonesian people. So th it seems that they 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 just they simply want to clo close everything. The church has suggested that perhaps your government is worried that some fretland guerrillas could be called before an international tribunal because they have things to answer for. Is that a consideration in opposing an international trial? Nós os timorenses só teremos moral para dizer que os outros merecem justiça se nós começarmos a justiça conosco mesmos. In Maliana, the women who lost their families have managed to continue with their lives, day after painful day. Teresino Cardoza helps run a support group for survivors of the massacres. She says she will never give up the fight. <laughs> The protesting soldiers have now retreated to the hills around Dili. And once again, the innocent are sheltering from violence, unsure of who is behind it, and with little faith the authorities will protect them. East Timor's beleaguered government insists it's hard enough to manage the present. But its people are asking what peace there can ever be if there's no justice for the past. Thank you.